Our main reading is from 1 John chapter 2, 1 John chapter 2, and it's verses 12 to 14, verses 12 to 14, 1 John chapter 2. So 1 John chapter 2. Reading from verse 12. Let's listen to the Word of God. I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of His name. I write to you, fathers, because you have known Him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you have known the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you have known Him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the Word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Well, those of you who are uh, familiar with this letter of John's, you'll know how John regularly refers to his readers about knowing something. Uh, For example, in chapter 2, verse 3, he says, we know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The one who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Two verses on, chapter 2, verse 5, this is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. I think there are about 18 such statements in this first letter. We know statements. Statements that John gives to give certainty to believers that they know. Don't doubt these things. You know it, don't you? We know these things. He's he's reassuring them. He's giving them certainty. But they're also there to highlight those who would be listening to this letter read out, to highlight those who would profess faith and yet whose life characteristically doesn't fit the statement. In a sense, each of them, if there are 18, each of them is, is a test. Each of them is a, an examination of sorts to assess whether or not someone is truly a Christian. For example, whether or not they know the true Jesus Christ the Jesus Christ that John and the other apostles knew of. That's how he opens this letter, verses 1 to 4 of chapter 1. Whether you know him or not. Here in these three verses, though, John is writing just sheer encouragement, pure encouragement. He is writing to to reassure his readers of of their faith. He he tells them six times. He's writing to them. A bit of OCD there. I don't know. Six times he tells them, I'm writing to you. I'm writing to you. But each time he tells them that, he has something really positive to say to them. Something true and encouraging for them to read. Either something true about them themselves or something that has truly happened to them. But John is being intentional in what he writes here. He's wanting to bring assurance to these readers, these readers who he refers to as dear children. He called them that in chapter 2, verse 1. It's as though John here has reached this point in his letter where he sets aside every hint of doubt. And now all he does is he focuses on confirming and reassuring them as true 
and sincere believers. Now, what does he mean by the terminology that he uses? He talks of their children and fathers and young men. Is, is John here describing stages in spiritual maturity? The children, uh, then the young men, then the fathers, as though he, he is recognizing, as the New Testament conveys, there, there is meant to be a progress in our sanctification. We are meant to be becoming more and more Christ-like as we grow in our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Is, is that what John is referring to subtly in the, in the language he uses? Or is he referring to his readers in terms of their literal age? Uh, the children who, of course, would be able to, to read the letter and understand, old enough to understand what certain words mean in his letter, uh, then the young men and then the fathers. If it is based on the literal ages of his readers, then how do we, well, how do we segregate you lot by age? You know, who wants to be young tonight? And we'll cut off there. And if you're above that, you're an old man or you're a child or you're a young person. I mean, how do we say? Whichever way you go with those two main views, Another problem you'll face is why, having started with children, why does John then jump straight to the other end of the spectrum, to fathers, to then jump back to young men? Why does he do that? Whether he means their literal age or their spiritual maturity, it doesn't make sense. It's not what I would have written, maybe some of us would say. It doesn't flow naturally, and there is a difference of opinion on why he did that. Let's not go down all those different roads tonight. The view that I'm taking this evening is that when John writes twice to children, he is referring to all his readers regardless of anything about them. In other words, such is John's affection for his beloved readers. As you see there in chapter 2, verse 7, he calls them dear friends or beloved. There's tenderness in the language he uses here. They are all as he describes them to be. They are his dear children. He repeatedly uses that phrase for them. Chapter uh, 2 verse 1, chapter 2 verse 18, chapter 2 verse 28, chapter 3 verse 7, and so on and so forth. This is John's letter, and he's writing to them as their spiritual father. They're his dear children. He's wanting to encourage them in their faith. And therefore, I, I take it then that the fathers and the young men are those who are spiritually more or less mature among them. They are the spiritual fathers of the church. They are the spiritual young men of the church, which means we can apply this both to men and women. Jews would typically refer to everyone in the congregation as brothers, brethren, uh, but it means brothers and sisters. That's what he means. So, so these are brothers and sisters within any congregation, and there will be some who are more mature in the faith than others. That's logical. That's natural. And therefore, as we look at these groups of believers tonight, there are certain qualities that we can dig out from how John describes them. First of all, what does John tell all of them as children? You, you see there he addresses them twice in verse 12 and then towards the end of verse 13. He says, I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I write to you, dear children, because you have known the Father. There is an argument to say that the word because doesn't mean that the reason John is writing to them is because their sins are forgiven, as though that's the only reason. Rather, he's writing to tell them that their sins have been forgiven. 
that they know the Father. John is here is wanting to affirm to them or affirm them in that their sins are forgiven. It's positive language here. This is reassuring language for them. In fact, the, the verb tenses are in the perfect tense. Their sins have been and they remain forgiven. And these believers have known and continue to know the Father. That there is no insecurity here in what John is saying to them. But what has happened to them is a completed act for them. That believers, those who have been born again of God's Holy Spirit, who know the true, the real Lord Jesus Christ, the apostolic Lord Jesus Christ, who have come to Him in confession of faith and who know Him as their advocate in heaven and who walk in the light as He walks in the light and so on and so forth. They know that His blood cleanses them of all their sin. It is they whose sins have been forgiven. This is who they are. This is how they are. Friends, this is who and how we all are, regardless of our maturity. All of us who have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, and by the grace of God we have accepted the, the diagnosis of Scripture. We've accepted how this book is like a mirror to us, and as we, as we have it held up before us, we see ourselves in it, we see our reflection, we see the sin in our lives, we, we accept what the Bible tells us, but we also believe what the Bible tells us, that there is a remedy for that sin in the person of Jesus Christ. And so we have rushed to Him by faith. We have run to the cross of Jesus Christ, and we have taken Him as our Savior, for all who have done that tonight, your sins are forgiven, John says. They are forgiven. Let me say it again. They are forgiven because of Jesus Christ. So we are now accepted in Christ. We are forgiven in Christ. We are fathered by the true and living God. There is now no longer any condemnation against us. But we are loved by the true and living God. Friend, your sins are forgiven. Maybe somebody needs just to take that in tonight. Through Jesus Christ, through repentance and trust in His name, your sin has been forgiven. Will you please believe that? And stop living your life under this cloud of, of shame. Yes, you believe it for the person sat beside you, but will you take it for yourself tonight? That through Jesus Christ, not in yourself, forget yourself. Think of Him. Because of Him, your sins are forgiven. That's what John wants us to know. Dear children, all the people who would read his letter, on account of His name, our sins are forgiven. Whose name? Well, Christ's name, of course, the the name of Jesus, because that's what He came to do. He came to save His people from their sins. So, so John not only tells us that our sins are forgiven, but, but lest we might ever think that we had somehow earned that forgiveness, that we had done something or anything to pacify that God that we have offended, John links our forgiveness with the name of Jesus. It's all about Jesus, you see, if you haven't got it yet. It's all about Jesus. 
He is the friend of sinners, and He is the Savior of sinners. We cannot leave Him purely as the friend of sinners, friends. He has to become their Savior as well. He is the friend and the Savior of sinners who alone secures their forgiveness. It's the blood of Jesus alone which chapter 1 verse 5 cleanses us of all sins. It's the sacrifice of Jesus alone which in chapter 4 verse 10 is the propitiation or the atonement for all our sins. It's in Christ alone our hope is found. He is our light, our strength, our song. So it's not in ourselves but it's Jesus who has liberated us. He has freed us from the guilt of sin, the penalty of death. And now we are God's children. We are His. We have been redeemed. We have been forgiven. We have been adopted into the royal family. Wow! And we now have this new awareness of, of God as our Father. We have this, this intimate awareness that, that, that He knows me, that He loves me, that I'm His. It's as the Lord Jesus, in effect, told His disciples in John 14, 7, that since we know Jesus the Son, then we know God the Father. And so we have eternal life. John 17, verse 3, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. What, a, what an encouragement then for all believers, every one of us to know that we are forgiven and that we now have this instinctive desire to, to respond to our, our Creator God as Father. Secondly, then, we have the fathers. And again, John writes twice to them, verses 13 and 14. Uh, but he tells them the same thing both times. I write to you, fathers, because or that you have known him who is from the beginning. That phrase, from the beginning, is something that, that John uses eight times in this letter of his, this first letter. For example, the very first verse of the letter, chapter 1, verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life, Jesus Christ. Chapter 2, verse 7, dear friends, I am not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. It seems that sometimes John connects that phrase with the Lord Jesus and his, his eternal nature as God, equal with God. Sometimes, though, John uses it to relate to when the eternal Son appeared. He began his ministry and began to teach and preach and to give his commandments. John even uses it for the devil, chapter 3, verse 8. He who does what is sinful is of the devil because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Here in chapter 2 here, John is using it in relation to the Lord Jesus Christ who is from the beginning. And these fathers that he writes to, whether they are male or female, but the more mature believers who remember their sins are forgiven, they have known the Father. Here, John highlights that they have known the Son. They have known the Lord Jesus Christ. There's the sense that these fathers in the church have a, have a depth to their spiritual understanding. They have a, a greater comprehension as to the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are, as it were, the Puritan within the congregation. Puritans were known for having a depth of knowledge that 
conveyed their depth of devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ. For example, anyone here who has ever read that book of Puritan prayers, The Valley of Vision, will know what I mean when you read how they describe the glory of God and the wonder of the Lord Jesus Christ. Get it if you don't have it and uh, say those prayers for yourself. Take them as your own. They reveal an understanding beyond many of us. Uh, or any of you who have read any of the Puritan paperbacks, the, the Banner of Truth series, again, they, they convey a depth of knowledge and sincerity that these spiritual giants had. These fathers of the church that John is writing to, they are the John Owens and the Richard Sibbs and so on and so forth of of any local church. They are the seasoned believers. These are men and women who have walked with the Lord for a while now. They have grown in His grace. Or they are those who are very young in the faith. They are young people and yet and we've met them, haven't we? They are surprisingly blessed with a a wonderful knowledge of Jesus Christ. Robert Murray McShane was such a man, a very young man, died very young, and yet he profoundly knew the Lord Jesus Christ in a remarkable way. But these are the pillars in the church. These are men and women with a true and tested grasp of who Jesus Christ is what he did for them on the cross in a way that causes us to break the commandments. We envy them because they seem to know him so much more. They know him. They love him. They follow him. They serve him. And every congregation needs them. You know, often the general picture of what a church wants is that of young families with breeding parents, or it's young people with their energy and vitality to serve. We want them on the rotas and all of that sort of stuff, and for sure those people are needed. Uh, we need them to, to you know, keep the, the, the wheels turning and all of that sort of stuff. But, but rather than what every congregation wants is what every congregation needs. And it's these, these usually older godly saints whose hands and whose feet have faithfully served so many others down through the years. And there they still are active in other people's lives whilst their own lives are, their minds are taken up with their Savior and where he is, and from where he is yet to come. Can I ask you younger people, who do you naturally gravitate to after the service? If you don't spend more time with older Christians, there's something wrong. Okay? There's something wrong. If all you hang out with are younger Christians, you're missing out. So, change your habit, okay? Try something new. <laughs> Go and talk to an old person <laughs> and, uh, and listen to them. Uh, ask them to share their testimony. Ask them what it's like for them to be a Christian at their age. But, but learn from them. Learn from these people who have been way down the road further than you or I have. What a blessing to have such people in a congregation. Uh, how do you become such a person? Well, age, time. But there is a connection here with Scripture and prayer. That's why we read from Psalm 119 earlier. They love Scripture. They love to read what the lover of their soul has written for them. And so they will read it, they, they will study it, and then having listened to what he said to them, they then respond back to him in prayer. So they pray, Scripture 
and prayer. It's those two boring things again. I'm sorry. Scripture and prayer. And if you do those things faithfully, humbly, reverently, you will grow. You really, it's not a pill. This world is obsessed with overnight transformation. Take a pill and in six days you'll have lost 50 kilograms or something like that. The world wants it now. God's way is slow but sure. And he works through his word, through his grace. And if you're not reading the Bible, you ain't going to grow. So take it up again. Begin to read it prayerfully and get to know this great Savior more and more. Thirdly and finally then is the young men. And again, as with the children and with the fathers, John writes two words of encouragement to them, verses 13 and 14. You'll, you'll notice there in verse 14 how what it includes what he wrote in verse 13. Verse 13 says, I write to you, young men, because or that you have overcome the evil one. But then verse 14 includes verse 13, but expands on it. I write to you, young men, because you are strong and the Word of God lives in you and you have overcome the evil one. So if the fathers within a church are they provide the anchor, the, the, the anchor of faith uh, within a church. Uh, if uh, if uh, to the others, the, the fathers are the mainly spiritually minded, the most experienced and so forth, then these young men, remember both male and female believers, these are typically, not always, but typically they are the younger ones in a congregation who, who have not traveled the road of faith as long as the fathers. And yet they are engaged in daily battles of living out that faith in the various struggles and situations of the world that are unique to them as younger people, typically. So if the young men usually are the younger in age, then whilst they may lack the depth of maturity, the depth of wisdom of the more mature the younger are often more zealous, often more spiritually energetic. It's usually the younger who are the more spiritually enthusiastic, which maybe isn't so obvious all the time in the older, more mature believers. For example, it's a fact that the most energetic, the most passionate evangelist is typically someone who has just come to faith. They're alive. They are buzzing. They are, whoa, they could, they want to take on the world. They seem so alive. Get them in your team when you go door knocking. They are so full of zeal and energy. They, they could take a whole estate on they are so convinced by this, this new thing that has come to them, which has so dramatically affected them. They have that zeal often not found among those of us who have been saved for a while. John wants to encourage them. Often younger people get criticized. I find that easy myself to do as a pastor, you know. When are they all going to come out tonight? Uh, but John just wants to encourage them. He wants to reassure them of who they are and what they have done. And that's maybe that's something for us all to learn rather than criticize our younger believers. Encourage them on, onward. Maybe there is a time to say something, but to encourage them on, to go on with the Lord. That's what John is doing here. He's wanting to affirm them by saying, you're strong. You're strong in the Lord and God's Word abides within them. And again, there's that correlation there then between Scripture and this, this strength they have. And again, that's fairly typical, isn't it, for someone who is a new believer. They, they have this new appetite to read Scripture. Uh, 
my own story, I mean, people were always buying me Bibles when I was younger. Why couldn't they buy me a Nintendo or something like that? They always wanted to buy me a Bible. And it just sat on my shelf at home. Uh, but I kept them. <laughs> well, I kept most of them. When I became a Christian, suddenly I wanted to read those Bibles. I couldn't get enough of those Bibles. And that's a great sign, you see, for someone who professes faith in Jesus Christ. What is their relationship to the Bible? Is it their number one textbook? Is it the thing that they read more often? Or is it just, well, I, 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 well they don't even have one now because it's on their phone, of course. But, you know, do they do read it? Do they meditate on it? Do they do a Psalm 119 on it? Uh, the Scripture abides within them, and that Scripture feeds this strength within them. It helps them, it strengthens them to live out boldly a faith that is winsome to others and persuasive to their circle of friends in which they still meet. John tells these people, you have overcome the evil one. And again, that verb overcome, it's in that perfect tense. This is something that has happened and continues to be so. They have already overcome Satan. My friend, if you are a believer tonight, if you are a Christian, then you know well enough how we all face spiritual battles. We we struggle, we, we, we face the, the schemes of the devil as Paul describes them in Ephesians 6. These, these are realities that every believer will face in one way or another. But the Christian life is also meant to be a life lived as an accomplished fact. In that in Jesus Christ you have been forgiven. You are forgiven. And in Jesus Christ, you have already overcome the evil one. So, yes, he may come and poke and prod and try to lure you back, but he can never win in the end. Yes, he can cause us to trip up. He can cause us to stumble. And we know people who have tripped up and stumbled. We know that. But those of us those who are truly born again, truly in Christ, they have already overcome. And not because of us, friends. The first time you start thinking that, you're in trouble. You really are. When you begin to think, well, I'm doing quite well, I... You know, I, I finally feel I'm mastering that problem I had. You're in trouble. Because the evil one comes and looks to trip you up again. It's in Jesus Christ. It's in faith in Him, trusting in Him, depending upon Him that we have already overcome. Paul writes in Colossians 2 verse 13 as we come to the end, God made you alive with Christ and He forgave all our sins. There it is again, you see. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, He disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by His victory over them on the cross. At the very end of this letter, John will write that though the entire world is under the control of Satan, these believers, those who have been born again of God's Spirit, as these children are, they are protected in verse 18 of 1 John 5. The evil one cannot harm him. God has saved us. God has sealed us with His Spirit and the one who was born of God. In other words, the Lord Jesus Christ Himself, He keeps us safe. So how safe are we tonight? Let me finish with what the Lord Jesus Christ said in John 10. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one 
can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one.